Greetings, this is again Dr. Jimmy, and this will be my tenth video in the series on the history of Halloween Horror Nights 20, 20 Years of Fear. Lurking in the shadows again, let's see if I can lighten up things a bit. Oh, there I am. And for those of you who are interested in that sort of thing, those obsessed with my t-shirts, today I'm wearing this lovely Doctor Who Abbey Road uh, take-off parody shirt, which is always a bit funny because... Um, shouldn't the angel be in the back, not in the front? Because how can he move if everyone's behind him looking at him? He's going to be stuck there. They'll never get across the street that way. And, uh, and the silent, well, he should be leading. That way no one will forget he's in line. See, so he should be in the front so everyone can see him so they won't forget about him. And the angel should really be, the angel should really be uh, in the back behind the dialect so that everyone won't, so otherwise he won't be able to move at all, you see. <clears throat> hold up the whole line. That's just my thinking. It was sort of ill-conceived when they put it together, though it is an amusing shirt. But enough of my silly t-shirts, which have nothing to do with Horror Nights. Sorry, at least this one doesn't. It's not a clue for anything, even though some people get that bizarre idea. And, uh, that didn't happen. Okay. And, uh, so, I left off in the previous video with the scare zone. Um, the scare zone, the first scare zone of the event, Escaleta Muerta, well, so, uh, maybe I mispronounced that, Escaleta Muerta, whatever it was called, yes, we covered that one, very fun. And so we go on to the remaining scare zones, at least to try to. Uh, the next scare zone was on Hollywood Boulevard, and it was called HHN 20 Years of Fear which is pretty much the name of the whole event, so you could call this the signature scare zone for the thing last on 2010. <coughs> yes, so that scare zone <coughs> had the warehouse. It was a retrospective scare zone of 20 years of horror nights, obviously. And it brought the warehouse, the same warehouse you might have seen on the television advertisement and also on the website and also in the house called a horror nights the hallowed past so this was another appearance of the of the warehouse at the event itself and on the website there were games we'll get to that later but uh, here when you first go into Hollywood Boulevard what you first see are some huge iron gates and at the other end uh, over by the Mel's drive-in there were another set of iron gates so whichever way you entered you would still go through these gates and they had the big double X image on them, and they also had the uh, the filigree, the patterns from the lantern itself. But they were open now, so it was almost as if you could go into the lantern. Ooh, a nifty idea! But once you got in, you went through another gateway, sort of, because they had the warehouse itself set up, or actually the walls of the warehouse, not this roof. There's no ceiling; it's a scare zone. And you're not inside a building. So, but you have an entrance way with uh, the warehouse, and it says property warehouse, and no entry, no unauthorized entry, trespassers will be violated, or something like that. <laughs> Not exactly, but that sort of thing. And when you get into that part of the uh, Hollywood Boulevard, there's all sorts of things set up with shelves and things full of all the props and wonderful things from 20 years of Horror Nights, including such nifty things as those little clown buggies that they rode around in in 2007 in the streets, there was the uh, signs from various things over the years. I remember specifically the sign from the drive-in in 2009 was there. Lots of other nifty things. One prop I have to call out to, very important for me at least, on one of the little shelves there was one of, the, uh, <clears throat> one of those little um, containment units, the uh, things that pop open, uh, the traps, yes, the traps for the spirits, for the ghosts from Ghostbusters. So there is a little a, a ghost trap. Uh, so that was really fun that that was there. A little homage to the early years of Universal, even though uh, the Ghostbusters did appear in some shows going back to like the very earliest years. So I guess uh, I guess that was a bit of a homage. But you didn't want to spend too much time looking at all the marvelous props, as nifty as they were, because you were going to get yourself really set up for a scare because the place was filled with characters from over 20 years not over but from 20 years all sorts of wonderful creatures that had appeared in horror nights over the years 
including body collectors and Mary Shaw gliding around, uh, some quite recent ones as the Wolfman and the uh, and Dracula as he appeared in Legacy of Blood with his brides from the previous year. You also had from 2003 the very tall sentinel on his on his stilts with the 13 image on him uh, the, from the same year the succubus and, and the uh, incubus Ravenna. You had uh, <coughs> sort of pale demon. You also had lurking in the streets you had Chucky and uh, and uh, many other creatures of the Ice Queen going back to one of the Islands of Adventures scare zones they had up in uh, in uh, Island of Lost Souls or one of those from one of those previous years you know, the Ice Queen and the Fire King when the Ice Queen was there looking quite sexy a chainsaw drill team member it was a good year for chainsaws there were chainsaws all over the streets in this particular zone, there was a really classic chainsaw drill team member and his sort of redneck uh, flannel type shirts, all torn and bloody with his um, a couple of them actually, very good chainsaws. And also, one particular character that really, really tickled me. I loved seeing this one, one who hadn't been seen since 1996, because he had a house in 95 and 96, but hadn't been seen ever since. The Crypt Keeper from. Uh, from the Tales from the Crypt, and he was sitting in a chair, a director's chair, dressed in the old-fashioned director's outfit with the big jog purse, the puffy outy pants, you know, and, and boots, and a little hat, looking just like he was going to see our action or cut, but he was just sitting there, really still. So most people, when they first saw the Crypt Keeper, thought it was a mannequin, because there were a few mannequins here and there in the scare zone, because after all, there are lots of props and big mannequins and masks along with it. So you assume it's just a static figure. So when it leaped up at you, oh my God, it scared the frick out of you. Oh God, that was scary. And it was really delightful to see the Crypt Keeper out there in the streets again, kicking it after all those years. <clears throat> so great scare zone filled with, with scares and fog and nostalgia. Lovely. Then we have another lovely scare zone located in Shrek Alley, which they don't use anymore, but they were still doing it back then. That's that little alleyway that goes from the Plaza of the Stars by the Monsters Cafe and takes you all the way over to Hollywood Boulevard almost by Mel's Drive-In. Today Transformers takes over the whole space. And back in those days, of course, you just went back to this big building that no one used. And you would go right through there and there was a great spot for scare zones back in the day. And the scare zone there was called the Coven, and it featured a coven of evil dark witches practicing the blackest of pagan black magic. Not white witches, not Wiccans, these were the other side of it, the dark ones. And they were there worshipping around a great standing stone that was made out of purest crystal. Must be something really evil there. They were worshipping that and, and practicing their enchantments on the poor passerby. And out of the fog would come two sorts of witches. One were beautiful seductresses, lovely sirens that would lure the unsuspecting in. And then the hideous hags would come out of the little huts. Ah, <laughs> oh, frightening. But what really made this scare zone work for me especially was on either end on both sides of the entrance and exit, which of course, which is exit, which is entrance, depends on which way you're going through. But on both ends, there were these great pyres, these great uh, burning at the stake setups, okay? And being burned at the stake, they were not witches at all, but the people who used to burn the witches, those oppressive patriarchal Puritan types, dressed in their sort of pilgrim hats and outfits, and they're burning, and they're all so, oh, bloody outraged at it. Oh. Help me, I am a righteous man. I should not be here. Uh, sinners should be burned, not me. And he's all upset and the smoke is rising up and he's ah, suffering that way. And I got a kick out of that, not only because you reverse the curse and, and, and burn the oppressor, but because, you see, I myself have some personal stake in all that. You see, I have ancestors who were convicted of witchcraft in Salem Village back in uh, 1691 or whenever it was, somewhere around the 1692, maybe off a little bit, but I believe somewhere around the end of the 17th century. I, my ninth great-grandmother, Susanna Martin, was convicted of witchcraft. She was over 70 years old, harmless little old lady, a widow woman, 
you know. But uh, apparently some of her neighbours coveted her land, and so they accused her of witchery. And so the trial was, of course, in those days, there was no defence for it. You're accused of a witch, you have to prove you're not a witch. If you can't prove you're not a witch, well, then you must be one. And they take you out and <laughs> hung you. They didn't burn them at Salem. They did that in England. But, in, but here, in, uh, here in, in, in the colonies in the United States, they, they hung them up. And, uh, and then after that, they take the corpse and throw it into a heap somewhere in a common grave. I think over on Gallows Hill or someplace. They just sort of dump them. Uh, not to be buried in, set in hallowed ground because they're evil witches, after all. Uh, in league with Satan, the way they thought back in those days, and so the poor old lady was killed in this nasty way. Since then, of course, they they haven't found the the remains, but they have put up memorials for them in Salem, which you can see to this day. In addition to her, I had two others in my lineal ancestors, my 11th great uncle and my 11th great aunt, who were both uh, accused and convicted of witchcraft. One of them was John Proctor. You might have heard of him. There was a play about him called The Crucible uh, by Arthur Miller, a very famous play. You might have had to read it in school, maybe get a chance to see it. It's really good. Uh, and of course, he got in trouble because a bunch of teenage girls, the ones who started all that nonsense, accused anybody they, they had a problem with. And I think there might have been some sexual tension here. But they accused poor old John Proctor of being a witch, and he ended up getting hung and killed. And the other one was Mary Bradbury, and she might have had some trouble with uh, some of her in-laws, <clears throat> the sergeants, who also were trying to get rid of her. So she got accused, and my 11th great aunt was tried, convicted, and condemned. But then they went to the jail to hang her, and her cell was empty. It was still locked, but she wasn't in it. She had vanished. Ooh, maybe she was the real deal. Or maybe her husband bribed a jailer. But in any case, by the time they found her again, the governor of Massachusetts a colony at that time had called the whole thing off and said, stop it, no more of this witchery, no more of these witch trials, it's getting out of hand. And so she was safe and therefore was able to have kids and her kids had kids. And then one of them was Ray Bradbury, who got to write all sorts of wonderful books. And I really, I really suggest you should read them. Great, great person, my ninth cousin, Ray Bradbury, ninth cousin three times removed. So that was wonderful. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, I had a personal stake. And uh, so it was like, I would be, I'd like shout out things like, vengeance for the ancestors. And people would look at me funny because they didn't know what I was getting at. Some people didn't like that though. I don't know exactly what the real reason was, but before the event was over, they took those Puritans out and those were just empty standing stakes with no one burning in them. And I don't know for 100% fact, but my theory is that some people of uh, uh, Protestant nature might have been offended and said, that's offensive. Uh, if they'd been burning witches, they wouldn't be it was offended. But no, 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 we can't be showing them burning Christians. No, that would be wrong. Even though they were the ones who were doing that to other people back then to show you know, them getting their comeuppance was somehow offensive. So, you know, I guess you couldn't do that, so they had to take that out. Also in the scare zone, there were a couple of interesting figures, uh, little, little black crows or ravens sitting up in the trees. Some people were so amused by them, they gave them names. One of them was called Ryan the Bird, and I forget what the other, Kevin, Ryan and Kevin, yes, they called them Ryan and Kevin the Bird. Uh, the same birds would pop up again and again throughout the years at Horror Nights. In fact, sometimes just so damn many... Cr you could, it was one year where you had birds in every damn house in Skerza. And so that, that's kind of become a, a trend to put these birds up every year. But they started out here, I think, at least they really got noticed and named Ryan and Kevin the Bird. <clears throat> so that was a lot of fun. All right. And the next Skerza, and this was, I said, it was a good year for chainsaws. The first full-out chainsaw drill team, and there were more than one that year, uh, was in Sting Alley area and around uh, the, that part of New York Street that's closer to San Francisco, a little further away from where they usually have them. And around the Sting Alley and Delancey Street area, they had souls and steam and had a really neat backstory. Apparently in an alternate universe, there's a city not called New York, but New Yorkshire. And they're on a world that is somehow very little, very little petroleum products. 
uh, everything has to run on water except they're running out of water and so there's a drought so they have to find whatever water they can to keep their whole steampunk uh, society going it's very steampunk designed all these gears and brass and leather and stuff so you have these guys with the goggles and the boots and all the steampunk attire with their big chainsaws I suppose steam operated chainsaws chasing you down and there's this guy standing up there who's calling because what they need is to get what the substitute for water it was blood human blood so they had this great big guy up on top of a scaffolding and he's got a victim who is usually quite hot and he was chained up there oh I'm I'm a victim I'm going to die and and there was a thing that you could see like body parts and water coming out and sometimes it would spray the gas you know as they and they take him into the machine to dissect him and get every drop of blood from his body, every bit of water. And in the alley itself, of course, there were all sorts of people with chainsaws in the fog with some of those eyes that sometimes they lit up. That was cool. And even on the back side by the waterfront, of course, putting it there made it the whole backstory of no water a little bit... Uh, didn't match the story because, look, at there's a lagoon right there. So why do you need blood if there's a lagoon right there? Come on. But in that back part, too, they chase you down. It was a lot of fun, very energetic. Some of the big hulking scare actors like Brian and others are playing the, uh, the uh, chainsaw men, pe the people of, of New Yorkshire. And at one point, uh, he looked at me and said, Go to the machinist! Like, like he, I was one who's full of water that needed to be extracted, I guess. Get myself dissected and dismembered. But uh, there was also something that went on in that scare zone that I didn't know too much about, but it had to do with a hat. Uh, apparently some sort of hat, and everyone danced around the hat and chanted or sang to it as some kind of a, a ritual. It was something that just sort of, they sort of made up as a guest and, uh, and scare zone interactive thing, sort of like cats and combs. And speaking of which, the same fellow who, who put out the uh, law cat sort of cats and combs things, that's Drew Shrimp, as we call him, Andrew. Uh, he put out uh, something saying straws and cream instead of, instead of, instead of souls and steam. And so at least one occasion, I went to Starbucks located nearby, got myself one of those uh, lattes with lots of uh, whipped cream on top and a straw, and I would eat the cream with a straw uh, in the scare zone to make the joke. I think some people got it at least, but uh, maybe not too many. So that was fun. Fun, fun scare zone. Uh, the next one was over in San Francisco. Remember, I said that there was uh, a story about z the ZAP installation in New Orleans, you know, the uh, zombie awareness program installation, that the trouble happened when a Mardi Gras float crashed in the building. Now you get to see what actually happened outside when zombie getting is going on inside. In fact, the scare zone and the house are pretty much one unit in a way, the story continued. It was like, in a way that we've never really seen before. We've had we've had scare zones that related to the houses, like uh, Streets of Blood and Body Collectors, for example. But in this, you actually had the story, uh, the storyline of the house, and the scare zone were interlocked. So here you have the actual Mardi Gras parade that was really ill timed because it occurred during the zombie apocalypse, six months after one. Why they still had a Mardi Gras? Well, I guess they had Mardi Gras only a few months after Katrina. So, hey. They, they continued, you know, life must go on. And so there's a Mardi Gras parade, and there's some floats, and, and people dressed as they would normally be for Mardi Gras. Of course, if you go to Universal, uh, outside of Horror Nights, every uh, February, usually all the way past Easter, <laughs> into the spring, they have, in fact, currently right now, they've got Mardi Gras going on, uh, which is funny because Mardi Gras is supposed to only go up to, uh, only go up to just before Lent begins. But you know, they go past Lent to Easter and beyond, you know, so hey, let's extend Mardi Gras season much longer than it's supposed to be, according to Catholicism. So they've got this, uh, they do that every year, and of course there's all sorts of hot, sexy people dancing and floats and beads and coins and doubloons and lovely Mardi Gras music. You always hear Ico Ico, and you always hear, you know, feet don't fail me now, all of that stuff you hear it all the time, it's lots of fun. So they do that. This was almost a parody of that, because they have some of the same floats, but there's blood all over them, and the Mardi Gras decorations, like they always have, with blood and gore on them. And in the streets, you have the Mardi Gras characters, including the hot guys without shirts, and the sexy girls, and their skimpy outfits, only they're zombies. So you have Mardi Gras zombies lurching about, and some of them are still sort of dancing to the music a little bit, as if they can vaguely remember that they were involved in 
a celebration before they became the living dead. And so you're going through that, and some of them have bit, you know, things they're chewing on, like an arm or a leg or whatever. Uh, you know, don't you know? Show me your tits. No, show me your dismembered body parts. That's it. Yes, and, the, and there's no beads or coins flying anywhere because they're not interested in that anymore. They want to eat your flesh. Now I'm getting another silly ding dong phone call. Let's see who that is. I don't know who that is. Uh, let me see if it's important. Uh, hello. Hello. Yes, I can. Who is this, please? I'm not interested. I'm not interested. Goodbye. It's one of those stupid calls you get from time to time, people trying to sell you something. <sighs> I hate when that happens. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes, yeah, zombie girl. Lots of fun. And one zombie in silver lame trousers and no shirt was really quite hot. Liked it quite a bit. And, of course, you did see the big float that crashed into the side of the building that caused, you know, the havoc inside of... Well, not havoc. That's a different house. But the... Uh, the... The... Uh, the trouble that happened inside the zombie Geddon house, yes. So you do have that. Lots of fun. And the music, of course, was the music they always played for Mardi Gras, only sometimes played in reverse or with interruptions and jumpings and scratchings, slightly altered and distorted. Fun, fun scare zone. Okay, there's only one scare zone left, Fear Revealed, but I'm running out of time, so that'll have to be in part 11.